ladies and gentlemen, good morning. We do realize that, of course, uh, occasionally, and this time, of course, following the gala dinner, some of the people might be late, but I see some coming, and uh, so let me just uh, suggest uh, that in about uh, two or three minutes, we start with this uh, session. This session, we have a honor and pleasure of having uh, Professor Karl Mulder speak on something which is very challenging, and you see that even from the very title itself. It says, Strategic Competences for Concrete Action to Sustainability, an oxymoron. An oxymoron being a term which is in contradiction to itself. Uh, of course, he has a distinguished career. Speaking just now with him, we realized that both of us started as, as a physicist, and then, of course, he went to a decent activity, more and more of engineering, while I continue with physics, and then and now we are both in what one may call trying to rearrange how the public and so on, the general administration and even the politics deals with this uh, important issue and oxymorons in particular. So if I may call uh, Professor Mulder, we are eagerly waiting for your presentations. Yeah, thank you very much. I must apologize, I have a bit of a cold, so uh, excuse me when I'm occasionally having a cough. Um, yeah. I want to start going back a bit in history because I want to reflect about, um, yeah, perhaps somewhat deeper about the role of sustainability in education and the role of, of sustainability in the technological community. And um, I want to go back to a very famous speech. I think it's more than, it, it's more than 50 years ago by the famous novelist C.P. Snow. And in 1959, he gave a famous speech in which he lamented the, the great divide between, the great cultural divide between the realms of science at the one hand and the arts at the other. And the one thing probably you can still very often see, I think most of you have a science or engineering ba background, is you can often see that intellectuals often proudly proclaim that they don't understand anything of these computers or so. And it, it is almost as if they present it as a sign for, for their cultural band. I'm really cultural. I don't understand this kind of technology. A certain pride, which is, of course, if you have a science or engineering background, a bit strange. On the other hand, you can often see, and of course the people from the arts point us to it, that scientists are often blind to the fact that life is not just a kind of optimization problem, but also about five values behind that. Yes, so we have to develop in our life compromises between various partly contradictory and op overlapping and partly qualitative and emotional demands. For science, so do, our real life is not really about just developing the optimizations with which scientists are very good by developing models. Now this was the great divide that Snow uh, sketched in his 1959 um, address. So, and what his conclusion was, was that he argued that practitioners in both areas should start building bridges uh, to further the, the, the development of human knowledge and for the great benefit of society. Now, I think this has had little result. You can very often still see the same kind of, of dilemma or the same kind of... of um, um, divide in, in our universities and in our cultural life in general. Oh. Hey. Well, 
Oh, yeah. um, I think very often you can hear my colleagues saying, oh yes, but uh, all these others, they are irrational. And I think if you look well, that then you can see that the other realms of, of, of uh, life are not always so irrational. You can say science is aiming for truth. Yes, that's a rational game. And we have all kinds of rational procedures to screen publications and to, to establish that something is a real truth. And you can say technology is perhaps in some respects a little different. Because we as technology, if we are speaking uh, from a technological university, we are not always aiming for truth. We are also we are aiming for efficiency. And sometimes we even don't understand the scientific laws b behind our machines, but that doesn't matter as long as the machine works as we want it. So that's efficiency, and sometimes it's a little bit different from science. But politics is in some respect also a rational game. It's a game for power. And if you really look to what politicians do, you always see that number one priority is how to get into power. So it's not an irrational game, it's a rational game. And of course, you have at the end another rational game in our society. That's the, the game of ethics and laws, aiming for justice. What is just in our society? You could say even at the end there is even another one, and that would be the real art but that is a bit of a different category. So there are different forms of rationality, but they don't understand each other very much. Now, I have difficulties in switching to the next slides. Oh, yeah. So <clears throat> I also see in our discussions on developing solutions for the environmental crisis, I see two kinds of of traditions, two kinds of rationality. And I think here in this conference, I see the overwhelming presence of, let's say, the analytic kind of rationality. We are here a lot measuring the effects of le legislation on, on what it brings to, to other parts of, of systems. We, are op present, we, we can hear here papers presenting optimizations of product designs and what it, how it affects material flows, etc. Or we can hear presentations about chemical processes, etc. It's all linear, and you can it, it's all linear models, and you can see uh, things like LCAs are very typical for that. The recent addition is, of course, dynamic LCAs showing potential for future, etc. The other, <coughs> you can say the critique against this kind of reasoning, of analytic reasoning in environmental problem is very often uh, threefold. You can see that many people say this is, this is hair splitting. All these things about green millet points in LCAs is actually rather irrelevant. That's one line of critique. You can say um, very often there is a kind of critique that this uh, optimization, for instance, by LCAs and by specific models of, of uh, technology is only marginal applicable because it doesn't, it is not applicable when you have really systemic change. You can't, you can't well, you can, but it's not really effective if you want to make an LCA of a totally different system that is unknown thus far. So it's very often marginal because it's not applicable to the real large transitions. And sometimes people say it's irrelevant because an analysis of a current system does not give you any clue of where to go. It only shows the problems of the current system. Now, a second culture is the culture that is perhaps somewhat less present, but I heard some of the participants presenting some work in this tradition, and that is, let's say, change management and policy. Transitions theory, for instance. Reflections on transitions, transition processes, and how to develop incentives for real encompassing change. Uh, it's basically, it's aiming to search, or it's aiming to find non-linearities in our society, in order to create 
and to el accelerate systemic change. How to come from this fossil fuel based society to a society completely based on renewable energy. Uh, there's also a lot of critique, of course, to that tradition, and you can say very often, uh, well, people tend to say, this is all fake talk, it's phrase mongers, people, uh, it's nothing concrete, it's a lot of talk without any action, uh, and it has a low predictive value, because you can, might say, perhaps you should do this and this, but if it actually is done, there's no guarantee for any success that we really get a transition to another society or another energy system, for instance. Now, this takes some time. To, yeah. Of course, analysis is important. And we need concrete, concrete quantitative targets in order to, to trigger action. Huh? If you don't measure very often, you, you are unable to change. Um, so change, and even if you, if you don't measure, you can make things worse. That is, of course, quite clear. On the other hand, strategy is also important. Therefore, uh, well, probably the iPad equation dating back from 1970 is quite well known, so I don't explain it. But it basically the lesson from this ehrlich holden equation is that we need very large changes. Now, if you're gonna, uh, if you gonna, going to develop a strategy for large change, you don't s start with any, in, uh, any optimization that you s just see because you don't know whether the optimization is part of a path that can lead to these large changes. If you want to have large changes, you should be sure that all the steps you are making are leading in a good direction. So there is a long-term strategy required for success. And th there are clear then dilemmas. Eh? So, my colleague, Professor Hanjelic, mentioned something about better combustion of coal. Of course, there is the dilemma, should we invest in research for better combustion of coal, or should we invest in research, for instance, to improve the efficiency of wind turbines? That's a clear dilemma. Perhaps not so much for the researcher doing the research, but it is for the funding agency. So, <coughs> we need backcasting. We need to set long-term targets, and then reason back what we should do now. And finally, there is the importance of organization. Um, we see in a lot of instances, and I'm just doing some research where, where, where you can see that very often there are improvements possible, there are great leaps even possible, but they are not core business for the, for the businesses involved or for the government agencies involved. So very often you need also champions, champions that pull, uh, uh, start pulling a project. So for instance, in industrial and urban symbiosis, those are the kind of, of uh, innovations that are in between various companies very often or they are in between various infrastructures. Now, who is pulling this? Who will take the lead and take the risk? That's an important question. Who benefits? Huh? Who benefits and, 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 and the dilemmas that are in that? For instance, uh, perhaps we discussed here a couple of times something like district heating. But of course, if you, as a municipality, if you invest in district heating, after a while, you are not interested anymore in passive housing because the success of passive housing will cut you in your own flesh if you have a municipal district heating system. So there is a kind of dilemma. Um, and of course, there is also a dilemma which I just will briefly mention here at the end. Sometimes even industry knows very well that if they invest in better products, that it will, it will cut their own revenue. There's a famous example, for instance, from tires in the 1970s where they improved a lot. 
you had to change your tyres in the no around 1970 every 20,000 kilometres, and and then 15 years later it was every 80,000 kilometres. So the sales of tyres, but by, by that innovation, were were cut by 75 percent. That is, of course, something that an industry might think about. So we need strategic and organizational competences to work towards sustainable development. And, um, well, if I reason back to my own history, um, we started at Delft University of Technology doing things on sustainable development in, in the 1990s. And perhaps we were a little naive because perhaps we... Well, we had a bit, well, there is this famous announcement, the older ones perhaps still know. Well, I, in my youth, I listened a lot to the Woodstock records, and I know there is this, fam I remember there is this famous announcement saying somewhere that we are from the peace movement, and the nice thing about the peace movement is we have no enemies. Well, some, something related is also true perhaps for the sustainable development movement that we were thinking a bit, perhaps in the 1990s, we have no, no enemies because we are doing, doing things for the benefit of all, for the whole world. And that perhaps was rather naive because we run into this kind of power structures. And of course we had a few outspoken enemies and they were nicely depicted in this book, The Merchants of Doubt, but they are rather marginal. Uh, I think, well, nobody takes them really serious anymore. So with such marginal enemies, was there only slow progress in sustainable development? And I will especially now focus somewhat on why is there so slow progress in education for sustainable development? Um, and perhaps we should take this in mind. Perhaps we have some false friends and perhaps these, well, not always too honest enemies, but the enemies I just showed are perhaps not even so worse. Oh, sorry. Um, So in some respect, perhaps, and that is a bit a challenging statement I want to make here, in some respect, perhaps, in developing engineering education for sustainable development, perhaps engineering itself has been a bit of a, of a false friend. And let me explain that by the next slide. There has been an American sociologist, a woman called Erin, Erin Check, who has been uh, uh, doing research on how engineering students from various U.S. colleges, how they uh, support public values. And there were three public values here. So, oh, no, I, was it this one? No, this one. No. Oh, influences of technology, and the third one, understanding how people use machines. She had questions to students about these kind of public values. And she studied this at three North American engineering schools, MIT, University of Massachusetts, Olin College, and Smith College. And what she found was, um, well, for me, rather flabbergasting. The, the support for public values diminished. So she, she was looking to first-year students, I think then it was second-year students, and the third one was just, was just when they graduated uh, at, at college level, so and as undergraduates. So uh, um, it was very clear that in all four of these schools there was the same tendency, that support for public values went down. The only one that was perhaps, and I think that is on the next slide, a bit of an exception, but was Smith College. Well, I get back to that. So 
One conclusion of Iren Czech was, over the course of their engineering education, students' beliefs in the importance of professional and ethical responsibilities, understanding the consequences of technology, understanding how people use machines, and social consciousness all decline. Well, and then the second conclusion was, little difference by school in how students' public welfare beliefs change over time. Other than Smith students, whose professional and ethical responsibility beliefs drop less rapidly than they do for MIT students, the decline in public welfare beliefs is consistent across schools. Now, Smith is well known for giving a lot of attention to public values and has a lot of liberal arts in their, in their so, that's why it was perhaps a bit of a, of a, um, of, had a little bit of another tendency. But also for Smith, this public welfare beliefs were dropping less than for the other schools. Um, yeah, what was the reason why that, uh, for that? I think Czech gave also uh, one reason, but one reason, of course, is, is that, well, I was personally often confronted with, uh, even one time I had, a, I had a nice meeting and I could give an address where in, a, in a panel where also our former Prime Minister Wim Kok was present. And after I said how students should engage with sustainable development, how engineering students should engage with that, he right away said to me, yeah, that's okay but we don't want our bridges to fall apart. So the fear is whenever you do a little bit of sustainability consciousness, of social consciousness to engineering, they right away won't, will not be good engineers. And I think that's rather nonsense. So Czech concluded also, even programs that explicitly attempt to create a structure and culture that diverges from historical norms have difficulty doing so because of the need to be recognized as legitimate purveyors of knowledge, for instance, through the whole accreditation process. So, I think it also is in line with some of our own experiences. Um, there was, in the year 2000, there was an uh, interesting survey that students organized among the new freshmen that were entering TU Delft. And, um, well, these stu this new students, without even actually knowing what this, their studies would be about, were asked, what should change in engineering uh, education? And the overwhelming answer was, we want engineering education for sustainable development. We want sustainable development issues in our education. Um, but afterwards, we, we didn't notice in, in actual practice, we didn't notice that there was a new generation coming with new enthusiasm for sustainable development. So it is a bit like the picture that I'm drawing is a bit this one. Uh, in the first year, people come in uh, uh, and after in the final year, well, we have a bit of different view of the world. So my conclusion is a bit, but perhaps we should mo have more evidence to prove that, that students are gradually drawn into a kind of technocratic identity of, and, uh, and that supports very much only a, a rather analytic sustainability approach, if it even supports that. But it certainly does not support a strategic sustainability approach. Um, so a culture of technocracy, and perhaps people always like that story, so perhaps I, sh I tell you a few examples that I experienced in 20 years in Delft dealing with all kinds of decision makers, how sometimes an astonishing level of technocracy sometimes exists. My favorite anecdote is that once I was with a dean of electrical engineering and he says, 
Sustainable development is none of our business. The, chair, the shaft is the divide. In generating electricity, the fuel consumption and emissions are from steam production, which is mechanical engineering. So it's not something for us. Well, the second one, DNET physics engineering. We don't want our students to do assignments in companies' agencies. They are methodologically too unscientific. Well, I, thought, I always thought that students, that engineers' main work is in companies and government agencies. But a professor of maritime engineering, also a beautiful one. Can you believe it? Government sent a sociologist over to interview me on green shipping policies. A sociologist, for God's sake. A professor at, at civil engineering to his students, don't engage with politicians. Avoid it if you can and disregard their comments because you know better than they do. And the professor at aerospace engineering during a meeting that was about, well, let's say, under development in Africa. The meeting was called, so focus on Africa. How my designs might help reduce poverty in Africa? Well, Africans are welcome to learn from my work too. Well, if that would be a great help. So, in, in general, the atmosphere is a bit, don't care about the issues that you, don't, that you cannot calculate. And so it's a, it's a culture of, of decontextualizing. And that is perhaps a major problem now. Yeah. So there is a kind of anti-sustainable development message between the lines. And that is science and technology are well ordered internally by their internal subdivisions. You have this subdivision, this is mechanical and that is electrical, etc., and their own rationality. And the challenges are actually, they are about the outside world, but very often they are completely internally defined. We don't want these companies to influence our methodology. So keep the messy reality of non-scientists out. And that is perhaps a real problem if you have this challenge of sustainable development. We can't keep the messy reality out. We should take it in. Um, now, what are the implications of this all? I think we have now already a tradition of, well, I think 20 years, not only in Delft, in various engineering schools here in Europe. We have a, a history of perhaps 10 to 20 years of, of sustainable development courses. And I think there are various... Uh, students that have done research on how effective these courses are. And it's quite clear that these sustainable development courses are effective and are successful in developing understanding of all kinds of phenomena. Uh, and uh, Jordi Stegelas in, in, in Barcelona even defended the PhD on this and had very clear data that showed this. But meanwhile, at the other hand, students become less engaged by the, well, what I call the institutional, institutional culture of disengagement. Don't bother with these things from society. Um, and then we need professionals that can combine analysis, analysis, strategy, and action. How could we do that? So perhaps the conclusion should be somehow that we need deeper changes of disciplines and educational programs, not just an add-on course, but if we want to, to really uh, train engineers for, uh, for, for um, the, the, the challenges that, that there are in sustainable development, perhaps we have to rethink our education far deeper and have to really uh, restructure complete programs. Uh, and I think this can only be done because universities and disciplines are, in, in my mind, really conservative. They are really always 
uh, well, preventing change. So I think this can only be done by external allies. Very often, universities think that they, they are ahead of everybody else, but very often you see that in industry is much more advanced in this regard. Very often, industry claims that it's very important for students to deal with sustainable development and not only do the strict scientific things. So, I think engineering students, they are very good in general uh, in analysis, and they are multidisciplinary in regard to that they have various technical disciplines, but they need strategic competences. They need to be able to engage with the stakeholders outside this world, and they need to have a long-term strategy. And that competence is still lacking. Now, click, click, click. So what do we need? Perhaps a review of the competences, we need engaged professionals. We need, well, I'm discussing engineers, but in general, we need people that are able to, uh, or that are engaged to solve problems of the world, not just their only, only the, 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 the problems that they define themselves. So solving the problems you didn't know you had in ways you don't understand. That's the kind of problems we don't need to solve. Um, we need also engineers that are able to really interact, not just communicate as a technical act of, of, making, of conveying a message, but also receiving a message. What, what do our stakeholders want, not just what do I want to convey? So I think this is a very <laughs> interesting shirt that this, that's here. Um, we also need engineers that are able to think socio-technical, not just in terms of a technology and how to optimize it, but how is a technology used in practice and what is, are the kind of problems that are related to that. How could I not just change the technology, but change the te technology and the way it is used? And of course, uh, that takes perhaps a somewhat new form of uh, engineering, and I also like this, this picture a lot. And of course, um, it was already shown in, in the survey of uh, Irin Czech, uh, we need engineers that are able to deal with the impact of technology and make estimates. Now, how to transfer these competences in our universities. I think, first of all, it, is a, it, is a it will be a process of long-term change. We can't do this overnight. It is a kind of cultural change that we need. And it is a, a cultural change in the university that needs dialogue, not force. You can't say now everybody should take this course and every professor should change his attitude so and so. So we need dialogue, we need convincing people, no administrative tasks because we all know how we deal with administrative tasks, we don't deal with them, we put them aside, and no obligatory test courses. I know that there is perhaps an interesting kind of saying but there is one thing that teachers very much hate, and that is being taught. <laughs> so don't send anybody to a obligatory staff course. So what we need is far more in our education is, is creating concrete, practical projects. And then we perhaps should invite the people that, uh, or the staff people that are really representing the disciplines to contribute. Now, to conclude, I think it's, it's very hard to change universities. They, uh, well, they exist. I know there are in the Middle East perhaps somewhat older universities, but the, the, the modern European university ha is, well, let's say about 
the age is about a millennium. I think the University of Bologna was the first in thousand something. Um, and so the university is a very, very old institution. I think there is only one institution that is older, as far as I know here in the West, and that's the Catholic Church. But if we are able, and that is the, the positive side of this, of such an old institution, if we are able to change that institution, it probably the changes will last also very long. And that is the good thing. Well, thank you very much. I want to conclude here. open for the discussion. Nevin? Uh, maybe to go a little bit into uh, the history of this conference, because we have uh, thought about many of these issues on the way. Uh, this conference has actually started as a, a skeptical uh, conference because the founders actually uh, thought that there is uh, life in all technologies. Uh, but in the process of time, the conference has been uh, adapting to the changes and I think now majority are uh, actually on the side uh, of the change. Um, I think that we are trying to move it to your second type of the big change conference, but of course most of researchers are still working in uh, uh, small changes uh, research. Uh, the, the, the thing I see as uh, an obstacle is the way people are divided in disciplines, because uh, uh, they're not even allowed to think outside of the borders of their disciplines, and this is what we need now. Yeah. We have to get out of the limits of our disciplines. Yeah, exactly. uh, one interesting uh, uh, example of a different university uh, I found in the uh, uh, University of Aalborg. Unfortunately, none of uh, the scientific committee members from Aalborg are here. Uh, they have a problem-based approach to education. So they set up a problem for students and they, they can use any type of uh, knowledge in order to solve the problem. I think this, is, yeah. this would be the better way than ex cathedra approach that we have uh, grown with. I don't know what is your uh, uh, experience with it. Have you ever thought in uh, Delft to switch to problem-based education instead of ex cathedra education? Thank you. Uh, yes, oh, but the second question is yes, but... Um, Perhaps, indeed, what I completely agree with you. The, the first problem is, indeed, that the disciplines are so defining what people do and are, there is so few um, interaction across the disciplines. I, I see it's also in the way even how you select which session you go. Oh, this is one. Oh, yeah, that's my session. Yes, he's doing the kind of work I'm doing. And oh, there are those guys. Well, I don't understand anything. So we are we are very much not. Uh, we are not into to trying to uh, create interaction across the disciplines. We are very much just looking for the same things that we do ourselves, and that is, uh, I think. Well, you see it even at a conference. You see it sometimes in identities of conferences. You know, oh, this kind of conference, it's always those kind of people. I don't like them. Uh, blah, 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 blah. I go to my own guys. Um, so we should break that. We should have far more interaction. And the other thing is, of course, we should also have that in, in education. There are some problems with, with this problem-based learning, I, I know. but. We also tried that in Delft, and I, in some faculty still have it. Um, one of the problems that was attached to problem-based learning was that it very often was group work, and that it was very hard to establish whether 
every individual fulfilled all the things we wanted the individual to fulfill. I think that is more or less something that we should find organizational or administrative measures to guarantee that. But uh, I think it's a, it's a good way forward to go to, 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 to far more problem-based learning because, yeah, it has the advantages of, of, of obliging people to interact. Thank you. We have another question there. <coughs> Well, my name is Michael Narodoslavsky from the TU Graz. Thank you, Karel, for summarizing 25 years of experience, and I share your experience completely. So universities are really hard to change, and I think we have to think about those alleys from the outside, and one alley could be the European Commission. And the reason for doing, <laughs> for the reason for the statement is that I, uh, a few years ago, I had it, one of the groups, that was in this uh, roadmap for education for the set plan. Huh? And the interesting point there was that all your points came up there. So the European Commission more or less realized that it wants to have an advance in terms of strategic energy technologies and what they realized is they don't have the staff to do that. They don't have the engineers to make the big turn. And all these possible ideas of actually linking up with reality, linking up and, and also exposing students to real world uh, problems and let them solve them together is of course on, on the agenda of the European Commission in this way. Um, by the way, for teachers, that's much more tedious to do. It's much more work to put into that because if we have this kind of problem-based learning, as you said, I mean, that is real work for teachers. It's much easier to give lectures yeah, yeah. than to do problem-based learning. Yeah. And it also means more people, more teachers, and more people involved in this process. Thank you. You have to comment on this? Well, I completely agree. The, the only thing is, indeed, that perhaps our teachers try to put few efforts into their education because European careers in science are so much based on publications and, and, and teaching very often doesn't count. So that is then also a problem that is related to that. Yeah. Thank you. Third question. Hello, Vincenzo Bianco from University of Genoa. I want to ask, uh, uh, let me say a simple question. So, uh, as you know, the um, European higher educational system is divided in three cycles, first level, second level, and uh, doctoral degrees. So if uh, we assume that after long discussions and projects on sustainable development, the, uh, there is the agreement to include some uh, sustainable development or strategic competencies in a course of mechanical engineering. In, uh, in your opinion, would it be better to include uh, these contents in the first level or second level? Secondly, uh, how many credits uh, would you assign for these subjects? And third, in, uh, in your opinion, uh, which are the three most important topics uh, to include and the three uh, learning outcomes which uh, derives? Thank you. <coughs> well, to start with your first question, I think uh, it would be, uh, so we, we, we first started in Delft 20 years ago <coughs> doing something in first and, and second level. But I'm now convinced that it's not enough. If you really want to achieve the changes that we want, you should rethink your whole curriculum. And then it's not just adding a course, but indeed changing to things like problem-based learning, for instance, and then, of course, well, addressing also the problem. And it c could even be very well that also in third cycle we should, we should do some, some things. For instance, um, uh, because people then are really going deep, and I would like every PhD to be able to, uh, to have a consistent story how his research or her research fits into sustainable development. And that is very often, if you, if you make this obligation, it's very challenging. What, does your, what are the implications of your research for sustainable development? I think every intellectual should be able to have a consistent story about that. 
Next question. Uh, louder, we don't hear you. For just a very fast follow up. I exclude, I didn't consider PhD because uh, PhD are a small fraction of the global uh, student population. Most of them uh, get the first and second uh, level degrees. Third level degrees is for few people. Yes, but okay. you know, the, the, I have one comment to that. Because the PhDs, those are the guys that probably will be the teachers of the, in the university of tomorrow. So if, if we give them four years to specialize and specialize deeper, then in fact that is a kind of process in which um, yeah, you, you decontextualize even more. Four years of study only on, on, on one subject without looking at the outside world means that you run the risk that these new teachers of tomorrow will then do the same in their own teaching after a while, and so you are back to zero. Yes, and yes. then as a last question you uh, have, yes. Zain Manan from uh, University of Technology, Malaysia. Um, thank you very much for a thought-provoking presentation. Um, you mentioned in your slides, a few of your slides, and highlighted some quotes uh, that uh, to the, to the effect that some academicians and professors uh, is quite detached from the community and politicians and things like that. Um, the fact is, these days, education, research, as well as accreditation process, the way they are implemented is quite the contrary. We are actually emphasizing on quadruple helix where it is not only uh, emphasizing on collaboration with industry, but also with the community, politicians, and uh, governmental organizations. And even the evaluation process, the promotion process, yeah, takes this into account. For that matter, the curriculum has been designed to cater for this. In some instances, academicians even regard not having their papers research and outputs benefiting the community, they regard it as a sin these days. So I do not know, I'm not sure where these highlights, what sample, how much samples you have for these highlights that you mentioned, but uh, I think that the, the, the thing is changing and it's quite different these days. Um, well, no, I, yeah, I could react to that. I think the, the situation in, well, I know my own university, of course, bad, but it's not turning for the good, it's turning for the bad. It's more emphasizing high-brow high publications and less emphasizing cooperating with society and, and, and uh, government agencies, etc. So, yeah, but things do not need to be the same everywhere. You're from Indonesia. I, I had some cooperation with in the past with somebody from ITB, and I know he was doing very valuable work with with uh, with society at large. Yes, as you as you describe. Thank you. My name is Jürgen Hake. I'm from Germany. You mentioned that you are looking for allies. Groups, allies. Yes. Uh, allies. Yeah. So I, I sometimes I think it's worthwhile looking uh, over borders, across borders. And I learned, and I think we all could learn a lot from sports, from team building in sports. So when you really want to play soccer at a very high level, so I'm not promoting German soccer, but Spanish <laughs> soccer. Yeah, so the Spanish soccer was for a decade so successful because they changed the whole culture of playing soccer, increasing the number of players in a team, changing the team, from, goal, from uh, game to game, and I think for the problems you have addressed, sustainable development, we have to build up teams with different competences which play together. Otherwise, we stick, and this is the problem of university and uh, academic education, we stick to very qualified specialists who are not capable of playing in a team, and uh, then I think we will miss 
addressing the challenges uh, ahead of us. Thank you. Thank you. And the last question. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the very uh, comprehensive and elaborative lecture. Uh, now, as you very rightly pointed out, the sustainable development is a multidisciplinary approach. So it is a must that we take all the players who are playing a big role together and so that uh, we get the success. Now, coming back to the education change in education policy, just to give you an example. In Italy, the region from where I come from, it is Basilicata in the south of Italy. So what we are doing, the uh, officer uh, at the, uh, from the Energy Environment Department at the government level, together with the small scale industry and uh, involving the university, they select uh, the main topics which needs to be solved, maybe in the bioagriculture, uh, agriculture, or it is in the environmental side or the waste management. Then they select the topic and then they approach our institution, that is R&D institution. So they give sort of fellowship they select maybe 10 fellowships, something like that. They select the candidate and then they uh, send those candidates to our institution to complete the final year of their degree. And at the end, they uh, prepare a thesis. And uh, the, I think this is a big step in that direction. So this was just an example. Uh, so for the education, uh, change in education is concerned. Now my point is that, do you have some additional input to, be, uh, to give in this direction? So for the change in education is concerned, based upon your experience? Thank you. You want to comment on this? No, I, I, okay. I can't. Uh, uh, the discussion, of course, shows that there are many other, but we will have to cut because we are approaching the time uh, of the coffee break, and the coffee break is quite a <coughs> sacred, actually, uh, thing in the structure of the conference because then it allows many people to interact among themselves, and that is very useful. Uh, let me uh, conclude this session by saying first that I want to recommend uh, to the uh, ISC of this conference to really maybe in the next uh, meeting to follow this very important subject because indeed uh, the higher education is undergoing a major change. I was uh, particularly negatively impressed by the data of Erin Check that goes that, that really shows the opposite trend. I remember uh, uh, a story being told to me by my colleague from the medical school in Zagreb where he said, you know, medical school in Zagreb is an ideal place where you transform the best uh, pupils uh, into fuck idiot. Uh, people who really know very, very little to follow that story, to know more and more about less and less and finally know everything about nothing. Yeah. On the other hand, of course, uh, uh, the quote uh, of your uh, dean of civil engineering who rightly said politicians know much less than you do. This is another extreme. Uh, politicians usually nowadays are very, very far from what was one politician 2,000 years ago, Alexander the Great, who had the best uh, possible teacher in Aristotle and who was really was, and actually he had the best machinery provided by him, his father. So this is really, uh, the higher education is a very, very tough thing and of course, as you correctly pointed out, is very conservative. And of course, that has been said, I believe, 100 years ago by a man who at that time was a president uh, of uh, Princeton and later on became president of the United States. And he said, uh, it's easier to move uh, the cemetery than to change anything in the university curricula or anything like that. So. Uh, on behalf of all of you, let me thank Professor Mulder for an excellent uh, speech. And now, now during the coffee break, he's your victim. Everybody should attack him and get all the questions. And Professor Mulder, this is on behalf of the organizers, the certificate of presentation. Excellent paper. Thank you. Very, very good. Very good. A lot of uh, very important things that you talked about. I, you know, I did not want to go too much into the, uh, the coffee break because, but there was, I guess, also. But your, your remarks, your preaching remarks about the relation between politics and So he was partly right. To get yeah. Well, but if you know that yeah. something yeah. is dangerous, you should yeah. be done. Yeah. 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 And and so. Which 
of course, was the beginning of the of the Bhagwash later on, you know, precisely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, saying, look, I mean, yeah, we gave you the bomb, but be careful what you are doing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, the, the problem is, you can read, I mean, when I quoted uh, Alexander, you know, of course, it's not easy to compare. But I think it is a real and not actually the task. The task no. is much more difficult than the task of Alexander. <coughs> he was just there to conquer the world. That's the easy task. <coughs> but, but at the other hand, I mean, but what politicians do and, yeah. and what, the, what, they, what they express is, of course, you make exercise the democratic system, but it's some it's kind of expression, expression of what the will of the people. people. Yeah. 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 Which, of course, means that we have to work with the people also, yeah. so to make them, you know, realize yeah. that. And that, of course, is a very, very difficult job that you are in, that you're yeah. trying to teach uh, students and so on, that somehow you have this, that, that's another thing, that there are many things that actually you are, you, you touch the question of, for instance, should they get the uh, hard? There's no doubt that these people should get an education. Should they get it within uh, the faculty of engineering, uh, where usually you get second rate uh, sociologists, second yeah. rate economists to speak, or they should get it outside? I mean, how, in that case, they get the accreditation. They, should they get it maybe at the end of their engineering, you know, at the age of 24, 25? Uh, and then the, the accreditation is non trivial. In the philosophy, went of course normally. I mean, uh, uh, hotels to do, uh, for us, the passport. So it's, it's very, very tricky. I think this is in the world academy. We are actually quite concerned with this education. If higher education, we believe, maybe wrongly, but I still believe it correctly, that we should start from the higher education rather than uh, going from the elementary and so on. Because I think elementary, to a large extent, we don't have that much. Uh, most of the countries, I mean, uh, there is no problem with giving them. Uh, but the upper education is, is a nice, uh, uh, yeah, well, marvelous, marvelous story.